Okay, in this series, we are going to talk about the way that we measure brain structure, the way that we measure the function of the brain. So um, essentially, we're looking at methodology in how we study the brain. So we're going to go through um, things like studying, studying uh, brain and behavior in general, the history behind that, um, studying uh, electrical activity, static imaging like CT um, and MRI, as well as dynamic brain Im imaging like EEG, fMRI, things like that. We're going to cover some of the chemical measures of how we study the brain, and there's a nice comparison chart at the very end that's going to look at all the measures, uh, all the methodologies compared to each other. So first of all, coming out of the gate, you guys know what neuropsychology is. This is looking at the relationship between brain function and behavior. Um, what's really interesting is that we use the process of elimination a lot of times in observation to understand what is going on in the brain. And so, for example, Paul Broca uh, discovered that particular area of damage in the brain is associated with language difficulties. And so we have now coined that area Broca's um, area and the type of language difficulty we associate Broca's aphasia as the kind of language difficulties you might have having a very specific damage in that particular area of the brain. And so um, if you look at the history behind studying the brain and studying um, the relationship between brain and behavior, what we find is a lot of times it really began with somebody, you know, performing an autopsy on a brain or doing brain surgery, finding damage, and then looking back and saying, what kind of problems did that person have? And then sort of correlating the damage with the um, symptoms that the person was was experiencing. And we also see this, of course, in animal work. We're mostly focusing on human uh, brain with this particular um, lecture, but of course, we can look at a lot of animal work as well. Um, so some things that we can do to look at neuroanatomy, um, we can take the histological approach where we actually take a person who's died and so section out the brain postmortem. You can slice the brain in really thin slices. Um, you can actually stain the tissue with different dyes to see different kinds of neurons or different kind of chemicals in order for that to be easily seen through microscopes. Um, there's a whole lot of techniques that we can use today to look at different um, molecular neurochemical structural differences uh, uh, across different neurons. Um, it just depends on the stain and the dye and the technique, but there are plenty of things out there that you can use to, um, to actually look at a lot of different types of um, tissue. So here's a couple of examples. So this is a low magnification A right here, as you can tell. Um, it doesn't give a whole lot of detail, but it does give us a good big, big picture. This is something we may want to stain to see um, uh, the density of neurons in a particular area. This would be a high magnification. As you can see, you can actually pick out um, the neuron here. Um, and you can even get even more specific with a high-powered uh, magnifier um, microscope. Um, and see here, you can actually blow this up to that. Um, so this would be an example here of one neuron. If you were interested at that sort of really, really molecular level, we can use electron microscopes as well as multi-photon microscopes, just depending on what aspect of the um, neurochemistry or neurobiology that we're actually interested in. So... <clears throat> um, if you look, for example, at Parkinson's disease, uh, what we found, our, the way that we discovered what Parkinson's disease was, was this idea that a person had uh, died and they did uh, you know, post-mortem analysis and found that there are particular abnormalities in the coloring of the cells and the tissues. And so what kind of... Um, what kind of, of showed this this particular um, uh, case was, for example, here, this would be a normal substantia nigra. And as you can see, it's called a substantia nigra here because of the darker tissue color. Well, that dark tissue color is missing in a person who has Parkinson's disease. And so when this was first discovered, seeing, oh, wow, these 
you know, colors are supposed to be present, but in this particular person, it's really faded. What's going on here? And those particular neurons in the substantia nigra, the dopamine producing neurons, um, they uh, essentially, they die or de degenerate um, over the course of Parkinson's disease. And so we go back and say, okay, well, we have this, this correlation, this idea that the neurons um, that produce dopamine and the substantia nigra are dying off or they're de degenerating, they're, they're becoming damaged. We're seeing a person with Parkinson's have an issue with initiating movement, with tremors, and you know this is an issue with, uh, with specifically within the basal ganglia. Well, now we can actually take studies of animals and destroy the area of the substantia nigra here. We can actually destroy these areas and see the same effects, the same symptoms in the animals that we see in Parkinson's disease, in human Parkinson's disease. And that tells us, that confirms the relationship between the substantia nigra and the symptoms uh, that were shown in, in Parkinson's disease. And so, you know, we can start with an observation and say, wow, that looks weird. That's different. This does not look right. It should look like this. And then we can go on and further um, use animal studies to really demonstrate if the evidence is pointing correctly to the right um, uh, conclusion, which is that the cells in the substantia nigra that produce dopamine become damaged, and that is what's causing the Parkinson's um, symptoms. So <clears throat> when we look at the field of behavioral neuroscience, this is looking at the biological basis of behavior in both humans and lab animals. So this is not specific to humans, not specific to lab animals. The problem that we get of course, is developing methods that are translational. And so what I mean by translational is that if we develop an animal model of, for example, autism, that has to be able to tr translate from animal to human. And so um, there are some models that we have that are um, better than others. For example, we have a model of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder in rats and and, and alcohol um use in rats that is very translatable to humans but in uh, in cases like autism which are really specific social uh, issues that a person has it's very difficult to get a model that's that's as translatable as some of the other diseases or disorders and so um, we use ethology to really and this is the study of animal behavior to really understand um, some of the things in human behavior that we necessarily couldn't get at. Um, you know, we try to create these translational models so that uh, we can get answers because doing experiments on humans would likely be considered unethical, but doing them on animals as long as we're able to provide information and we're able to actually give um, a good answer to to a question about human behavior is, you know, is much less likely to be turned down for ethical reasons. So, you know, this is definitely a, a challenge and complication when it comes to studying human behavior and disease is we need to make sure to do it ethically. And so a lot of times we bring in animal models when we can't study something that we would, would like to study in humans in an experimental way. Now, of course, we do test humans um, we do not neuropsychological testing to look at things like um, memory disturbance. Um, and so, for example, if a person has damaged the temporal lobes, whether it was trauma, whether it was a toxin, whether it was um, uh, a stroke, it doesn't matter. Um, if the person has temporal lobe damage, a lot of times they do complain of memory disturbance. They say that you know, they might have difficulties um, remembering or, or thinking of a, of a word, um, something like that. But we know that memory is not just a one function, right? It's not just um, one particular area of the brain Memory is not just one thing. Um, so we can have memories for our events, memories for our life, episodic memories, um, memory for that time that you went to that wedding or that time you went to that funeral. Um, we have memories for uh, colors, for categories, naming, for places. Um, we have motor skills that are uh, procedural memories that are sort of outside what you can do to describe them. So we call them um, non-declarative memories. So, um, you know, how do you write a bike? That's really difficult to describe to somebody every single muscle and every single thing that you do to get onto the bike and to balance. 
Um, and so that would be like, for example, motor skills and non-procedural memories, uh, excuse me, procedural memories. All of these memories are different kinds of memories. And um, depending on where you have damage may or may not be affected by that damage. And so it's very, very rare to find somebody who really has all forms of memory impacted. Usually it's, you know, they have problems with memory of, of, of a particular, um, of, of, of events or memories of naming things, or they might have, um, a lot of issues with pretty much all memory except procedural memory, how to do things, how to use your body and motor skills to do things. And so it's very, um, important that you study every aspect of memory to get at what is damaged and what is, um, spared. So one example of testing human memory is using the Corsi block tapping test. So this is really interesting. So what you do is you have this sort of platform here, and then you have these um, blocks. And so these particular blocks, this would be the experimenter's view point here where you're looking out. So you're kind of sitting right here. Um, and then the person who you are testing is standing on the other side. So when they're looking at is a completely um, non-numbered block. Okay. So they're looking at a block and it's got no number on it. And what you're going to do is you're going to tap with a block. You're going to tap in a particular order. So let's say you tap seven, then you tap one, then you tap six, then you tap one, and then you tap two. And this person's job who you are testing is supposed to remember the order in which you tapped. And so you wait for them. And let's say they tapped seven, but then they tapped four, and then they tapped two, and they forgot the rest. Now you can say, okay, this person is probably having a difficulty with their short-term recall, specifically their spatial memory. Um, so they don't see the numbers. They just have to remember in space, in place, which ones you tapped in what order. This is not an easy test. This is one that requires a lot of focus and it requires the person to really be sitting and paying attention. Um, and so, you know, the numbers are there for you. <laughs> Because they're easy for you to see, okay, which ones did they tap and in what order did they tap them? Were they correct um, and did they do it correctly? So, you know, um, this is a really interesting way to test um, nonverbal memory because, you know, there's no sort of verbal aspect here. They don't talk. They don't see numbers. They don't see letters. They don't see anything. They just have to kind of follow your pattern. Um, Another way that you can test memory is by doing a mirror drawing task. Now, this is a really, this sounds really easy, but I promise you, if you tried it, it's really difficult. What you do is you have a picture. So in this case, the star is being used. Um, this is a really common uh, test. And so the star has, if you can see here, it's got um, like a pathway. And your job is to outline the star. And you think, wow, that sounds really easy. But you are actually using a mirror. So this right here is a mirror. Okay, and you're not looking at this. There's actually a lot of times a block here, so you can't see it. You are trying to, to um, trace the star right here, looking in the mirror. So, you know, up is down, down is up, left is right. It's really, it's a really difficult test. And the, it's supposed to be difficult. It's supposed to be a test that you really struggle with. Um, and every time you move outside of the, the outline, you, that's an error. Okay. Now, if you continue to do this over time, you get a lot better at it. So if you practice three times in a row, four times in a row, you'll start to actually um, get really good at tracing it using the mirror. And we're going to talk about HM later. And HM had um, his hippocampi removed, and that impacted his ability to form new memories, but it did not impact his procedural memory. It impacted his ability to remember doing this, but the actual procedural memory of his hand doing the motion was intact. So he would do the test and forget that he'd practiced it, do really, really well on it the 10th time he's done it because he's practicing it, forgot that he had actually practiced it and would make comments like, wow, I'm really good at this. First try, that's pretty crazy. And, and in fact, he might've been working on it for weeks. So this is a really interesting um, part of memory that can be preserved when other types of memory might be damaged. Now, 
Another task is recency memory task to look at, do you remember something that you just saw? And so, you know, um, in memory, we have the primacy effect and the recency effect. So the primacy effect is um, at the beginning of the semester, you might remember things that we first talked about, or forget everything in the middle, and then remember the last thing, the most recent thing we talked about. So the recency memory task is capitalizing on the recency effect. And so it's trying to see if you remember a particular thing that you saw. So maybe the last thing you saw was a tree, Okay, and so it's asking you, did you last see a lion or did you last see a tree? And so you would then say, you know, last thing I saw was a tree. And so that's a way for you to be able to test the person's um, ability to remember things that they just saw. Now, <clears throat> when we're looking at the brain, we can modify the brain. We can see how behavior is affected by that particular modification. Okay. Um, and so we might want to do something to the brain that um, impacts it, changes it, and then we measure uh, what they're able to do prior to the manipulation and then after to the after the manip manipulation. So um, what what's good is that with with the modification, you can first develop a hypothesis about how the brain affects behavior. Say, I think that the hippocampus has something to do with, with making new memories. So you develop a hypothesis, now you can test it. Well, I'm gonna remove the hippocampus in this person or this animal and see if they can now create new memories. And so you can actually uh, test these hypotheses by making the manipulation and seeing what happens. So in the case of, for example, a rat, if you remove the, hip, the bilateral hippocampi, both hippocampi, they're not going to be able to um, go through mazes and learn new, new um, tasks because you've taken out that memory. So you can confirm your hypothesis, okay, this, the hippocampi are important for creating new memories. So um, we often talk about this in terms of brain lesions. So Carl Lashley in the 1920s wanted to know where memory was housed in the brain. He thought, okay, there is a location, um, there's probably a, a spot that memory lives in the brain. And then what he ended up doing was taking, I believe it was rats, and then just randomly lesioning out different parts of the cortex. And so he did this by ablation, which is removing or destroying parts, pieces of tissue at a time. And so he was concentrating in the, the cortex when he should have actually gone to different areas of the brain um, and he would have been more successful. But he used ablation to try to find um, where memory was located in the brain. And so we can use tools like the stereotaxic apparatus to be able to... Um, um, decide which specific part of the brain we want a lesion. So here, for example, if we want a lesion this particular part of the brain, we can actually use atlases and use um, very specific measures so that we only lesion out or target um, or ablate exactly what it is that we want to remove. And you don't want to just willy-nilly start, you know, ablating everything because then you don't know what specific part um, is actually correlated with the, the, the symptom or the uh, behavioral change that, that came to be. So it needs to be very controlled, you know, one animal at a time looking at the lesioning. So again, Lashley removed these bits of cerebral cortex when studying memory to try to see where is this, this hiding. Um, Scoville is very well known for um, being the um, doctor to remove the hippocampi um, from HM. And so uh, what he ended up doing was trying to treat his very severe epilepsy. When he removed bilaterally the hippocampi, he uh, produced amnesia in HM. He was no longer able to uh, create new memories, so he had anterior grade amnesia. Um, and so we learned that the hippocampi are very important for creating new memories. Um, and in the Parkinson's disease, we learned in animal studies, when you ablated the substantia nigra, you produce the same symptoms that we see in human Parkinson's disease. So brain lesioning um, has been very uh, important for us to understand what those brain areas do um, specifically in, um, in those areas. And you can do it through the course of, of actually taking a scalpel and removing a piece. Um, it, it can be done through laser. It can be done through neurotoxins that target 
a very specific uh, type of neuron and removes it from that particular area. So there's a lot of different techniques that you can use to lesion. The idea is, is you want to get as very specific and targeted as possible because you want to only limit it to the very specific area that you're trying to take out or, or damage. Now, <clears throat> another way that we can actually measure behavior, um, and in some cases non-invasively, in some cases invasively, um, is to stimulate the brain. And so um, Penfield, for example, stimulated the cerebral cortex in humans through neurosurgery. That's a very invasive method. Um, but if you poke different parts of the brain, you're going to see different reactions and different um, uh, behavioral changes. Um, if you look at this in terms of animal studies, if you have a rat, you can actually place electrodes directly into the lateral hypothalamus. And um, when that particular part is stimulated, you see that rats will uh, actually engage in eating. And so if you give rats the opportunity to self-stimulate or um, be able to be in charge of the current, um, they will actually press a lever to stimulate that part of the brain. And that part of the brain um, is uh, impacts a neural circuit that is involved in both eating and pleasurable sensations. So um, the rats are essentially uh, self-stimulating to feel that, that, um, that particular uh, pleasurable sensation. Now, let's look at this in humans. So there is a technique uh, called deep brain stimulation, and it's used actually as therapy. Um, it's used in cases for... Um, Parkinson's, a very, very severe depression and obsessive compulsive disorder. This is when you're seeing that the person has exhausted all treatments. They either can't have certain treatments or they've tried them and they don't work. Um, this is not a sort of trivial, oh, let's just try this out. This is brain surgery to implant pacemaker um, and the actual um, stimulator lead, okay, and the, the um, electrodes into the brain to allow the person to control the specific stimulation and electrical current. And so if a person, for example, is going through a major depressive episode, the idea is, is that they can then control the stimulation um, and uh, reduce some of the severity of their condition. Same thing with obsessive compulsive disorder. The person is experiencing um, a really hard time with dealing with that. They can actually um, stimulate the, the, the inner portion of the brain and be able to um, uh, recover more quickly from, from specific episodes. So again, this is not something that's used as just uh, you know a first line of defense. This is something when person has exhausted all um, other um, treatments and they just, they're, they're kind of at their, at the, at their last straw because <clears throat> it does require brain surgery. Now, another more up and coming technique is something called transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS. And this is, um, uh, starting to get some really interesting, um, um, results. And so there's a particular um, uh, neuroscientist uh, who's working in South Carolina with this, and um, it's now sort of being used to treat things like depression, um, bipolar disorder, things like that. And so what you're doing is you're taking a magnetic coil and you're putting it over the skull. So there's nothing that you're actually, it's not invasive, you're not um, uh, opening the brain or placing anything in it. But the idea is, is that you're trying to stimulate the brain with this magnetic coil. Um, sometimes uh, it's used to either induce a particular behavior or disrupt ongoing behavior. So this wand is placed over the scalp, okay? And, and that is going to send um, a, a stimulation, a magnetic stimulation to the skull. And then um, you can see here, uh, it'll actually... Um, um, stimulate very specific areas of the brain that you have decided to, to put it over. Um, I've actually seen it happen where you can place it over different, uh, like the motor cortex, and the person can actually lose the ability to move their hand for a little while. Um, and it's also used for things like uh, stimulating areas of the brain that we associate with um, uh, the symptoms of depression and trying to get people to... Um, uh, not experience such severe episodes. So, um, like I said, it's, a, it's, it's more of a new treatment. Um, there's some studies going on to test it. It's not as readily available in all places um, as a treatment, but it's starting to gain a little traction.
Now let's look at measuring brain activity. So we're going to talk about electrical activity here, um, specifically with um, EEG. Um, so the brain is always active, electrically speaking. Even if you're in a, a coma, even if you're asleep, um, you can measure the electrical activity in the whole brain all throughout it, and you can measure it in very specific parts of the brain. And we do this um, through either electroencephalography or EEG or event-related potentials or ERP. It depends on what we're trying to get at and specifically what we're trying to measure. So EEG is looking at the summed graded potentials from thousands and thousands of neurons. And so you essentially put um, a cap or a series of electrodes all over the brain and you are um, essentially, so this is like a person's skull, and so you would have, depending on the uh, amount of electrodes you have, sometimes we have um, 64 channels, sometimes um, we have fewer, sometimes you have 128, it just depends on um, what, what kind of cap you have, or how you're placing these electrodes directly, and there's a specific um, pattern that you place it, and these particular electrodes are taking in information about um, the electrical activity. So the EEG is going to change, patterns are going to change um, depending on the behavior. And so um, the uh, different patterns, uh, sometimes they're rhythmical, sometimes they're not, just depending on um, exactly what you're looking at. Um, you can actually see these patterns through EEG. Uh, it's used to test, for example, if you have epilepsy, it's used to see if you have seizures where those seizures might begin, um, how are they spreading, how is the electrical activity spreading over the brain, um, all of that can be measured through EEG. Um, so if we look here, uh, you can actually see different waves depending on specifically what level of consciousness or what the person is doing behaviorally. So we see uh, usually alpha, beta wave, alpha and beta waves when a person is awake or excited. As a person starts to, 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 to become drowsy, you see sort of uh, increased amplitude, sort of slower frequency. When a person enters deep sleep, you'll probably see delta waves that are really slow, um, high amplitude, um, really, really, you know, deep sleep will be really slow waves. Um, if a person is relaxed, you're going to see um, different um, wave pattern versus a sleep, depending on what part of sleep they're in. Um, if they're in REM sleep, for example, rapid eye movement, it actually looks very similar to when the person is awake, except that the difference is the person is completely paralyzed, their muscles are paralyzed, and their eyes move back and forth. Um, here you would see even further slowing for someone who's in a coma, um, and just depending on how responsive they are, if they're responsive in any way, um, you might see changes um, given um, different, different particular situations. Now what's interesting here is I've got a, an example of um, some EEG uh, waves here, and if you notice this right here that's in the red box, this represents um, eye blinks. And so one thing that you have to be really careful of is these electrodes, which are placed all over your scalp, and then you have some on your face as well. If you move too much, um, you actually can mess up the different brave, uh, brain waves and create abstracts and artifacts, and the waves become impossible to actually read. So these right here are examples of um, of eye blinks that get in the way of the data. And what you do is you actually do analyses where you take this information and you kind of exit it out. So every time you see major eye blinks, you're going to take that out and then you're only going to analyze the really good, clean waves. And so this is just typical that you have to do um, in an EEG analysis because you're going to have people who blink, you're going to have people who kind of move and readjust, and that artifact can cause problems um, because it'll interfere with your analyses. Now, another way you still have these electrodes placed, you can um, also measure something called event-related potentials, or ERPs. These are really complex uh, brain waves, and they are in reaction to a specific uh, timed sensory event. So, for example, if you want to have somebody who is responding to um, a... Uh, a buzz, like um, you know, they maybe you're um, they they feel a sensory buzz on their hand, um, or if they're looking at an image and you want to see how they respond to a particular image after they're viewing it, 
um, or if you want to hear somebody who is experiencing a particular noise or a sound, you can actually measure their ERPs, the response of the brainwave to that specific sensory input. Now we do have to um, counter something called a noise effect, which is uh, basically just like an eye blink. If there's something that gets in the way um, or their response is abnormal because there was something else going on, a sensory input going on at the same time or a similar time, um, that can actually cause overlap and issue and artifact. So you have to repeat the stimulus uh, repeatedly. Um, and then you take that, maybe you present it a hundred times. And then you take each of those and then you compile them together and average them. And so um, it, the more you have, the cleaner the average is going to be and the more accurate it's going to be. Now, some advantages to EEG and ERP is that they're non-invasive. You're just putting the electrodes on top of the scalp. Um, it's not, you're not, you know, putting anything directly into um, their, their skull. You're not opening anything up. Um, and it's, and it's generally low cost. Um, you know, the equipment itself is rather expensive, um, and you do have to maintain it. Um, but compared to like, for example, um, MRI magnetic resonance imaging, um, to, compared to a CT scanner, um, these are ve very considered very much low cost. So here's an example of an ERP that's a singular first response. And as you can see, it's a rather messy um, response. This is something that is, for example, a person listening to a tone, and this is their reaction to that. And then after 10 of these, you start to see a much cleaner response. After 50, even cleaner. After 100 of these, you get a really nice, clean average that you can actually see a very distinct wave pattern appear um, that can demonstrate uh, their reaction to this particular tone. So um, it's really important to make sure that you have plenty of response, plenty of stimuli to allow for plenty of responses. Now, you can use this to uh, study not only you know how a person is responding, and each of these are the electrodes that the um, that's going to give you feedback. You can also see where in the brain this response occurs. Now, the issue with EEG is it's fantastic when we're talking about temporal data. So over time, so if you look at a reaction uh, within milliseconds. Um, the brain will, you know, respond to a tone or respond to an image within just a few milliseconds. And EEG and ERP, ERPs will pick up on that and give you data. Um, so temporally speaking, over time, EEG is fantastic. But the problem is, is it's not as fantastic when it comes to location. So spatial data. So knowing exactly where in the brain it occurs, it does an okay job. Because these electrodes are placed on the scalp. And, you know, we're talking about the kind of outer portion of the cortex. And we can then um, try to place a location to where that ERP is located in the brain where it's happening. But generally speaking, it's a lot more difficult to get the spatial location data exactly where is this happening in the brain compared to when is this happening in the brain. And so what a lot of researchers are doing is they take a person and they take an anatomical scan from them. So they'll use, for example, a static imaging technique like CT or MRI. And then they take this information here and they plot it directly on a person's exact anatomy. And so that is where you actually become much more accurate, where you can get these hot zones and know this is where the activity is taking place. Um, but again, it's not as accurate, you know, uh, spatially as it could be um, without combining both a static technique plus um, a, uh, an ERP. So let's move to this static technique. So um, one example is computerized tomography or CT scans. Many of you may have had a CT scan if you've had an injury. Um, you don't need, I mean, you can CT scan any part of your body. Um, it's not specifically, you know, just the brain. Uh, if you've, you know, had a um, uh, pain in your leg, for example, or your back might have had a CT scan. Um, but we're specifically talking about imaging with the brain. Now with a CT scan, um, you're going to see that an X-ray beam is passed through the brain, several different angles, and that is going to create layers of images. And those images are going to then create a 3D image of the brain. So think of like a stack of post-it notes, right? So a stack of post-it notes 
is made up of tons of different other post-it notes and you can actually flip this and um, you know you can actually <clears throat> uh, uh, with big stacks of, of post-it notes actually get them in different shapes and so the idea is is that you build every single little tiny slice together and it creates a 3D image. And so this, for example, is one slice of an image and you can get this at three different angles. So you get this, you know, from um, the side, you get it from the top and you get it, um, you know, all three angles. And then what happens is, is that you put them all together and then you have a 3D image. Um, and so here, this one slice shows us that there is a portion of the brain that's missing. And so this is just filled with cerebral spinal fluid. Here's a ventricle here. You can kind of see this is also filled with cerebral spinal fluid. That's normal. You should see that. This right here is not normal. This right here is filled with, it's kind of a void space filled with cerebral spinal fluid. And this shows a, a lesion. So in this case, probably caused by a stroke. Um, and so that particular area of the brain lacked oxygen and that tissue died off. So if you turn it here, you can actually see the lesion from this side. Um, and you can see how deep the lesion goes. You can see exactly where it is because you have this 3D image. CT scans are really good um, and they're very helpful when you're trying to visualize an injury or visualize the brain in a static way. It's just a picture of the brain, um, but the quality isn't as good, for example, as MRI or magnetic resonance imaging. Now, magnetic resonance imaging is a technique that does the same thing. It produces a three-dimensional image of the brain. And so just like I had described before, you have these different slices that you put together of the different angles and you place them together and it ultimately allows for you to stack these images into a 3D picture. So you can actually move the brain and manipulate the brain. And I'm going to show you a, um, a, uh, a, a way that you can actually visualize this using um, an MRI app on my um, iPad. So this would be an axial scan where you can actually see, you can move through and every single one of these is an individual slice of the brain. And so you can actually move through. So this is um, the top of the brain going all the way through. These are the eyes right here. And then as you move through, that's the, um, the jawline and the bottom portion of the brain. So that's an axial scan. A coronal scan would be like slicing from the face back. And so here you can, so here's the nose and the mouth. And if you move through, you can see the eyes here, and this is the front, so this would be like the frontal portion of the brain. And as you move through, you can see, um, then as the brain is moving towards the back, there's the cerebellum and the back of the brain there. Um, and then you can look at a sagittal view. So this would be like cutting slices from one ear to the next ear. And so this would be um, starting with one ear, and then um, here you can see as it moves through the skull, and then here's a side view of the brain. There's the eye, um, part of the mouth, and then the uh, actual, you can see the, the sinus cavity there. Um, and then the, again, this is just the sort of side portion moving through. You can see um, the cerebellum and the pons and the midbrain and the uh, cerebral cortex moving all the way through to the other ear. And so this is a way for you to actually take um, the different scans and you can uh, place each of those views together and what that does is provide you with a 3d image that you can actually rotate even better than that um so how does mri work so it uses radiation um but in a in a way that is um not uh, damaging like for example an x-ray would be and so it's actually measuring the radiation that's emitted from your hydrogen atoms. So if you look here, each portion, each type of tissue is represented by a different color. And you can change these contrasts as you scan. It just depends on you know, what exactly you're interested in. So here, anything that's filled with water or cerebral spinal fluid, anything that has a heavy water count, will show up as dark. Um, you can see the, uh, that the skull here shows up light. Uh, white. Um, here you can see the, the white and gray matter um, are actually different colors. And that's because the makeup of the tissue is different from white matter to gray, to gray matter. One is a high fat content, and the, which is, you know, white matter is made up of um, all of the myelin sheath. And gray matter is made up of mostly cell bodies. And so because the, the um, lipid makeup is different because the water content is different 
different from the cerebral spinal fluid, um, you have different number of hydrogen atoms in each of those tissues. And so the uh, MRI, what it does is it will use these magnets. So these are huge magnetic coils that spin super, super fast. Okay. And so what it's what it's doing is, is it's trying to align your atoms, okay? And so in your brain, your atoms are kind of um, sitting around uh, doing their own thing. And some are, you know, some are moving this way, some are moving that way, some are moving this way. They're all sort of randomly spinning in their own little worlds, right? And so as the MRI uh, uh, spins, as the magnetic coil spins really quickly, the um, magnetism actually changes the uh, orientation of each of your atoms in the same direction. And so depending on what your atoms are made of, if they're mostly, uh, you know, depends on how much hydrogen you have, um, they will then, they'll align all together and then they'll go back to random at different times. And so the MRI is actually capturing that. It's capturing the uh, rate of time that it takes for those atoms to move from being completely aligned to going back to random. And because each one, um, so your white matter will go back to random at a different time from your gray matter from a different time for your cerebral spinal fluid, it's actually able to capture that in a specific image and then um, takes each slice, so it might be, you know, um, a three millimeter slice or a one millimeter slice, depending on um, what your, you know, what your settings are, um, and it'll essentially stack those slices together so that you can then um, produce a 3D image. And so um, if you ever go into MRI work, you'll study a lot of physics and you'll study exactly how this process works and how this is able to generate um, an image. Now this one right here, this is a colored image and this is not typical what you would see in an MRI. Um, this is uh, the typical kind of view that you would see um, with an MRI. You would, you would basically see um, this sort of black and white with a different kind of gray structure. That, that is typical. Um, depending on how you analyze it and how you actually change contrast, you can see different colors. But that's not typical of what you would see um, with your data. Now, <clears throat> diffusion tensor imaging is really cool because it can show you uh, nerve fiber pathways and it's looking at the directional movements of water molecules. It can give you some really, really cool pictures on things like you can uh, really see the corpus callosum, you can see some really cool kind of these rainbow uh, looking pictures that are looking at specific pathways of nerve fibers. And so if you have a particular person, let's say that they are having issues with their um, uh, motor or balance or, or motor skills, you can actually see very specific nerve fiber pathways that might've been damaged. That's harder to see using MRI. Um, or harder to see in a stagnant image. These can actually give you a really cool picture in terms of what does that look like following that specific nerve path. Um, so it's really helpful in finding abnormalities in neural pathways. Um, and again, uses uh, the um, water uh, molecules to be able to image that. Now, um, so these are static imaging techniques, meaning it just gives you a static picture of the brain. It's just something that you can take a look at um, that isn't a changing brain. It is nothing's happening behaviorally. This is just kind of pictures. If you wanted to get dynamic brain imaging, which is what's going on with the brain um, as you're doing something, then you would need something like functional MRI or fMRI. So fMRI uses the same MRI machine, except that it is looking at the flow of blood. The idea is that it operates on the principle that the more you're using one particular area of the brain, the more energy it needs. So your brain is always working. Everything is, is always moving. There's no such thing as this 10%. You're using you know 10% of your brain. You're always using all of your brain all the time. And whatever you don't use dies. So if you lose uh, um, uh, blood or oxygen to a particular area of the brain, then that particular area is going to die. It's going to be damaged. So you're constantly needing blood 
and oxygen and glucose to feed your brain because it doesn't have fat stores. So the idea is that you're always using blood and oxygen and glucose, but when you are more specifically using a portion of the brain more than others, it needs even more energy. So it needs more blood, more oxygen, more glucose. And so fMRI works on this principle that there is an increase in oxygen produced in this particular area because that tissue needs more energy. So um, this amount of oxygen in an activated brain increases in this specific area and the changes in oxygen content is going to mag- uh, alter the magnetic properties of the water in the blood. And if you um, run an fMRI scan, the idea is, is that you can pick up on this change and be able to analyze it and say, well, this particular area of the brain is being activated because there's more blood flow to it. Now, the problem is, is that it's not very good when it comes to temporal data. The timing on fMRI is extremely tricky and it's very hard to measure. Um, There's a lot of things to account for, like for example, getting that oxygen to the brain. Um, How long do you wait from the onset of the sensory input, whether the person's viewing a video or an image or they're having some, you know, something touch them. What's going on? What is the behavior? And then how long does it take for the brain to, to, to actually respond to that? Spatially, okay, um, fantastic. Because you're getting this beautiful picture of the brain. Um, with fMRI, it is fuzzier, but you have their original static image that you can place over that, and it's it's spatially a, a beautiful thing. Temporally, if you compare it to something like ERP, it is not as good. Um, it is just really tricky to get those measurements down. So this would be an example of how you would do it. Um, you know, you'd actually get these. So here you can see this would be uh, like a static image that you can actually overlay onto this um, so that that way you can see exactly where it's occurring in the brain. Um, so you get these fuzzy images and you try to get this activation occur at the right time, okay, um, depending on where the stimulus is coming from. Again, you're trying to time it just right. But you're going to have a delay in response because the brain has to process that. So that's a really difficult thing to pinpoint. And the idea is, is that you take all these images and you add them up and then you subtract them from the off images and then you overlay that onto what we call the baseline or the static image of the brain. And you're trying to um, say uh, minus the dead activity where nothing's happening, um, what is left over? And that activation is then what's left over and you say that's the area of the brain that's operating. You could also do something called resting state MRI um, and this is where the person is just sitting there and instead of just a static image with the MRI you're running an fMRI protocol and so um, what's really interesting here is you're getting this uh, this uh, dynamic um, activity of a person just sitting still and not doing anything. So, you know, you would ask them to clear their mind. And so you want to see what is the brain doing when it's not doing anything because the brain is always doing something. And so sometimes you can see people, um, uh, even if they're not engaged in a particular task, they might see, uh, they might see images in their head. And so you might actually see the occipital area activate because they are, thinking of something or they're, they're, they're seeing something in their head. And so, um, in order to avoid too much kind of noise, you really have to get the person to really commit to just sitting and doing nothing. And you can see some really interesting activation in in just these resting state images. Now, another type of dynamic uh, brain imaging is called PET or positron emission tomography. And that's looking again at blood flow changes. Um, but now you can actually look at metabolic activity. So instead of just looking at the sheer, is there more um, uh, blood content here, water content, this can actually look at specific metabolic activity, it can actually look at oxygen or glucose specifically. Um, and it's used by uh, the way that we do PET scans is we actually inject radioactive molecules into the bloodstream. So you would actually have it injected. Um, Now, you can also have CT scans uh, with injections. We're not going to talk about that. That's for 
for not necessarily the same sort of thing. Um, a lot of people have that done for medical reasons. We're just talking about this in, in response to PET scans. But you would um, uh, take this radioactive molecule, you'll inject it in the bloodstream, and then you can then kind of um, see reactions based off of how the brain is responding to um, and emitting those particular uh, radioactive materials. Now, one issue is is extremely expensive. MRI is also extremely expensive, but PET is even more expensive and it's more dangerous because it becomes invasive as you add the uh, radioactive molecules. If a person can't have radioactive substances in them, let's say that they have particular organs that don't work properly, maybe their kidneys don't work right, um, it can't fill filter out the, the toxin and so it can make them really sick. So if you're taking certain, certain medications or if you don't want exposure to radiation, then you really shouldn't have a PET scan done. Um, it's done, it is done in experimental purposes, but a lot of times you see it done in the medical field when um, there's, you know, there may be that you have cancer and they're trying to find if there are other um, cancerous uh, tissue in your body, you can you do a PET scan. Um, and so medically speaking, it's used um, in uh, uh, certain cases where uh, there aren't any other scans that are appropriate. Um, but when it comes to looking at this experimentally, you do have to be very careful about repeated scans. Um, the medical um, uh condition of the person um, if you're doing it for experimental purposes because you want to pick somebody that doesn't have any complications from taking the radioactive dye. Um, so here this would be uh, an example of um, here the the person in the actual scanner um, and so uh, these uh, positrons um, from the radioactivity are released after uh, the the dye is injected. They're going to collide with the electro uh, electrons in the brain, and the photons are produced, um, and then they exit the head. And that information is then gathered from here, and you can actually get some really fantastic images with, for example, some hot spots of um, what specific metabolic activity are you tracing, and um, what is you know what are you most interested in. So it's got some really really awesome um, abilities, but again, it can be really dangerous. So we can um, actually detect all sorts of radiochemicals with a, a PET scan, um, and you can map these, and that can give you lots of information on brain changes, diseases, conditions, what the person is experiencing. Um, it can detect specific neurotransmitters, density of receptors, uh, metabolic activities that we can associate, for example, with learning and, and developing connections. We can also get information if the person has been exposed to a neurotoxin and where is that going and where is the damage as well as degenerative processes. So if a person has Alzheimer's disease, it can be used to kind of track the degeneration, where did it, you know, where is it going and how has it changed, you know, since five years ago. It is widely used to study cognitive function, but again, it is expensive and it can be really dangerous. So you have to be um, very careful with it. So this is, um, I'm only showing this because it, 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 it's the same sort of process as fMRI. So you have, um, what you're doing is you're interested in the difference in activity. And so you add up all these different images um, based off of what it is that you're following in the brain, whether it's a metabolic thing, um, a neurochemical, whatever it might be. You're going to add those up and you're going to subtract them from any control condition that you do. Um, and then whatever you get out is going to be the mean difference of the image. And so you're interested in taking out any of the control, minusing that out, and then whatever's left over is the activation that you're interested in. And so that representative image is what is then reported as this is what we found. And so the fMRI process um, and the PET scan analysis process are relatively similar in theory um, in how you do it. Now, another dynamic uh, brain imaging technique is called near-infrared spectro uh, uh, excuse me, spectroscopy. Spectoc I have just been talking way too much, and that's what happens when you when you go too far. Um, so this is an optical uh, tomography, um, and it's also referred to as NEARS. And so what this is, it's a non-invasive technique. You don't actually have to um, uh, put anything into the brain. You don't have to um, uh, 
uh, open anything or um, it, it's not invasive in any way. Um, what it does is it, it allows for um, us to be able to take light injectors and um, uh, uh, expand light through the skull onto the surface of the of the cord cortices, and so it's in uh, what what you're able to gather is the blood oxygen consumption that occurs at um, the top levels of the um, of the cortex. Some really interesting things, uh, some advantages is that it's really easy to get people hooked up, especially compared to some of these other techniques. It's not as expensive, um, but the problem is is that you know you're taking the light and it's penetrating the skull, but not too much far uh, through the cortices. And so it doesn't give us a lot of, you know, won't give us any midbrain information um, or anything like that. So if you look here, we have a light injector that starts here and then a detector that gets the information. So this is putting the light out and it's able to penetrate through those first few layers of the cortices, as you can see here. And then that information then gets portrayed to the detector. <clears throat> and then you can uh, look at blood oxygen um, consumption. But again, it's one of those things that um, it's not as widely used because it can only get at the surface level of the cortices. Um, the uh, One of the final ones that I want to talk about, the final one I want to talk about um, in terms of measuring the brain is microdialysis. And this is something that we use to measure brain chemistry. Um, this is invasive because you are actually um, uh, using a, um, a, a catheter and microvial to uh, collect um, uh, fluid. Uh, and so what this is used to do is to actually see what's in the extracellular fluid. And so what you do is you take a, a semi-permeable membrane um, in the, uh, and you place it in the brain. So you actually, um, and, and this is done in animals and in humans. So you take this catheter, you place it in the brain, and then here on the end here, we have a semi-permeable membrane here. And so what ends up happening is the fluid is going to flow through and it's going to pass through the membrane here, okay, because it's semi-permeable. So it's able to allow for um, information to go through it. And then it's going to um, pass along the membrane. And then the diffusion is going to drive the passage of those extracellular molecules across the membrane into a, a, a collection container. And so um, it's going to exit the tube and then be collected in a microvial here for analysis. And so um, that those, the, the, the chemical makeup here can tell us all sorts of really great information, um, you know, you would most see it done in, in medical settings. For example, let's say a person is going through surgery or they had a, uh, an infection or something that you need to um, monitor, maybe their glucose or their glutamate um, because, uh, you know, you need to make sure that um, their blood, their um, neurochemistry is at safe levels. And so um, if you're going through different kinds of, of situations where, um, you know, you're having surgery done, uh, they may already have this in place. And so researchers might contact you to do a study to measure the chemical, um, uh, what's going on, chemically speaking, in your uh, fluid, in your cerebral spinal fluid. And so um, in essence, they can actually perform different experiments with your approval and consent and, um, and look at some really interesting sort of chemical makeup that they can't really do in a non-invasive way. Um, so this last uh, slide here is uh, just a comparison table of all of the different kinds of methods and why we would use them, what's the goal, and then examples of each. So this is a really good kind of um, conclusion, a con conclusive uh, slide that can put everything together for you um, in terms of being able to tell the difference between the different kinds of analyses. Now, we didn't cover genetics or epigenetics um, specifically. Uh, there are definitely analyses that you can do um, in gene expression and DNA analyses to, to actually link up genes to brain, genes to behavior, gene expression, brain and behavior, all these things, um, but we're not going to go into, into detail on those. So if you have any questions, um, please let me know and I'll be happy to answer them.